Thank you so much. Again, it is indeed a privilege to be with you this day in this special day in the life of this church and um, to share with you and Phil and Angela this time together. Our scripture lesson today comes from the New Testament, one of the most um, unusual, if you will, uh, different, if you will, parables of our Lord, which we find in the 20th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, beginning with verse 1. And this is the reading of the Word of God for our hearing today. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour he went and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also will go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others, still standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the eleventh hour came, and each received a denarius. So when those who came were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Those men who were hired last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day? But he answered one of them, Friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Are you envious because I am generous? <coughs> Thus saith the word of God. God bless his holy and his divine word. Hear the parable again. It may have happened. It may have happened just this way. Nervously. 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 She looks out the door. Nervously, she paces back and forth in her little house. Nervously, she sweeps the dirt of the dirt floor from one side to the other. She is panic-stricken. She begins to pray, Lord, oh Lord, where is my Joseph? Where is my Joseph? The hour is late. And he is not home. Has something happened to him? Is he okay? Why has he not come home? And in the midst of that prayer, a little tug of, happens to her, her dress. And her little five-year-old daughter looks up and says, Mommy, where's Daddy? Where is Daddy? Why is he not home? It is already late. Is he bringing us something to eat, Mommy? Mommy, I'm hungry. Are we not going to eat tonight? Where is Daddy? And with that, the door burst open, and there he comes. There he is. Hello, you two beautiful women of my life. We have a feast tonight. Look what the Lord has provided. The Lord has provided bread, and the Lord has provided cheese, and the Lord has provided some figs. And even for the two wonderful women of my life, God has provided a little bit of honey. And with that, the mother says, But Joseph, how did you get all of this food? Where did it come from? 
I went to the marketplace today and I saw you late in the day still standing there, not having found work. And I just wondered uh, what had happened to you. If, you. if something had happened or were you reluctant to come home empty handed without food for the family for the day? He said, honey, you would not believe it. It was the most amazing thing. I was standing there about the 11th hour and I'd almost given up because I did not want to come home again empty handed. I did not want to see the hungry eyes of you and little Elizabeth. I did not want to lie in bed another night with the growling of my stomach not quite drowning out the cries of my daughter saying, Daddy, I'm hungry. I want something to eat. And then this man came up at the 11th hour and he said, why are you still standing here? And we said, well, no one has hired us. He said, I will hire you. Come and work in my vineyard. And we said, for one hour? Well, you know, a few pennies is worth nothing, is more, more than nothing. So I went and I worked. And at the end of the hour, he gathered us all together. And would you believe he paid us first? And he paid us a denarius. Those of us who only worked an hour received an entire denarius, just as much as the ones who had labored all day long in the vineyard, in the hot sun, and in the dusty vineyard. Some of them, to be honest with you, were a little bit angry about it, but I didn't care. I rushed to the market, and now we have this feast before us. Come, let us sit at the table, break bed together, and thank God for his generosity. And with that, the mother said, uh, Joseph, uh, let me ask a question if you don't mind. Why are there just three loaves instead of the customary four? And why is there... Looks like some of the cheese is missing. He said, well, on my way home, I thought of the widow Sarah. And I wondered if she would have anything to eat tonight. So if it's all right with you, I stopped by and gave her some bread and cheese. And she said, oh, my darling, generous Joseph. Of course it's all right. Of course it's all right. Now let's come together around table. And thank God for his generosity. An unusual story. Different slant, isn't it? Usually different from the parables of Jesus. I mean, when you begin to think about it, I mean, what would a labor relations committee do with that story? <laughs> I mean, what would uh, a good lawyer do with that story? Uh, what would a union representative do with that story? I mean, it is, it is quite unusual, isn't it? As Barbara Brown Taylor says, well, I understand the story, I think, uh, but it's like, sort of like cod liver oil. It may be good for you, but it's awful difficult to swallow. And that story is just a little bit difficult to swallow. It seems just a little bit uncharacteristic of today. And right in the middle of all of that is this landowner. This landowner who is generous, who is generous to a fault, and who is generous to everybody. Now, why did Jesus tell such a story? Well, we see in the 19th chapter that maybe God's economy of things is not quite the economy of our things. Just a little bit different. For we see in the 19th chapter, a man comes to Jesus. We call him the rich young ruler. And he said, I am wealthy. I am educated. I am prominent. I have kept the law from the very beginning. I have kept the law to the nth degree. I know that I am welcome into your kingdom. And to make a long story short, Jesus says, uh, well, hold it just a minute. Uh, for you to enter into the kingdom of God, uh, you have to sell all you have and give it to the poor. And with that, the man's, man's mouth dropped open, and so did the mouths of the apostles. For in the same, Jesus also said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again, the apostles' mouths opened and said, if a rich man cannot make it, then who can? Because they thought if 
if you were rich, that was because God was blessing you. And if you were poor, that was because God was punishing you. And Jesus says, that doesn't hold water. And to beat it all, Simon Peter sort of nudges up against Jesus and says, uh, 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 we're going to be first in the kingdom, aren't we? I'm going to sit at your right hand when you come into your kingdom. You know, Peter was wanting all of those, you know, ministerial advantages, you know, the little sticker on his car that says clergy, and he'd have a special parking place at the hospital, and uh, he'd get those ministerial discounts here and there, and he'd have honorary doctorate before his name. He wanted all those advantages to being on the inside and Jesus said well you're going to be on the inside and you're going to have some privileges but they're not exactly what you think for you see God's economy is not like ours God's economy is a little bit different so when we read this strange story, we begin to ask, what does it mean? Or better yet, where are you in the story? Now, few of us, very few of us, I hope, have never known real hunger. But in those days, if a worker did not work that day, sometimes his family did not eat that night. A denarius was the wages for an honest day's work. And if you did not work that day, you may not have, uh, have anything but an empty cupboard that night. So a few of us have known real hunger but yet almost all of us can identify with the one hour worker or the 12 hour worker the 12 hour worker and somebody even in the parable wants to compare themselves with each other well, how do we compare how do we compare ourselves with those missionaries who spent all those years in school, all those years in seminary and college, went to language schools, are separated from their families, sent off to fields only God knows where, dealing with difficult situations, hostile environments, many diseases, often separated from their family, their own children, sometimes their own grandchildren. How do we compare with them? We don't. And what about those bivocational ministers, often deprived of as much education as they would desire to have, yet work all week long, sometimes 40 and 50 hours a week on a regular job to earn bread for their family. And then in their spare time, on their weekends and in spare hours, they spend studying the Word of God that they might minister to their churches, loving their people, being faithful to God, and loving their families doing without many of the privileges that some of us have. How do we measure up to them, those bivocational ministers who are some of the real heroes of our faith? We don't. And what about that single mother? who through death or divorce has lost a, a, a partner and now works job long, hard hours each and every day, scrimping as best she can to provide a, a family atmosphere and food and nourishment and clothing and the necessities of life for her family, often to the neglect of her own health and her own well-being that she might provide for her children. How do we compare with her? We don't. We don't. But some of us are those 12-hour workers. You've been in the church all your life. You've been there every time the door is open. You've worked in the nursery for 30 years. You have changed more baby puke and dirty diapers than Gerber. I mean, you've been there. When nobody else would do it, you were there. And you did it because you loved the children. And sometimes you were glad some of them didn't show up. But yet you were there <laughs> serving in the nursery. You worked in the Bible school in the long, hard summer days. You worked outside and inside taking care of those children. You've listened to long, more long, dry sermons than, than can be counted. You've heard more long, dry preachers. You know those preachers that can stir up dust, water skiing. You've been there. You've heard it. You've listened to every single 
single one of them. And you've tithed. And when they had special promotions at the church through missions or building programs, you gave even more. You served on every committee on the church at least twice. You mowed the grass and you got the t-shirt to show it. I mean, you are the 12-hour worker. You are the backbone of the church. Without you, the church would not be here. You're that 12-hour worker who's labored long and hard in the hot hours, the 12 hot hours of the day. And then here they come. These one-hour workers just got here, just entered the faith. They don't know an introit from a benediction. They know nothing about the faith. They don't look like you do. They don't smell like you do. They don't talk like you do. They don't dress like you do. They don't worship like you do. They don't sing like you do. But yet they're supposed to be equal to you in the vineyard. They think John 3.16 is a restroom on the third floor. They don't know one thing from another. But yet they're considered to be equal to you in the faith. And we say... Unfair. Unfair. I mean, they, they, they just walked in the door and they're considered equal to us and receive the same payment and reward as do we. You see, we have a choice. We have a choice. We can either let God's graciousness flow in and through us or we can gripe and grumble that God is gracious to others. You know, sometimes it is difficult to rejoice and celebrate God's gifts and goodness to someone else. It's all right when the welfare wagon rolls up to our door, but what about it when it rolls up to the door next door to those people who are not as deserving as we are and haven't worked as hard as we have? What about them? Sometimes, you see, it is difficult. It is difficult to celebrate God's goodness to other people. Jonah. <laughs> Jonah was called to be a missionary to Nineveh. What did he do? Ran the other way. Ran the other way. Finally, he made his way back. Finally, he did go to Nineveh. The people repented. He got mad about it. Want to get mad? He said, I knew you'd be kind and generous to them people who didn't deserve it. <laughs> you see, sometimes it is very, very difficult to be celebrative of the goodness of God to others. But then we remember that it is the goodness of God by which all of us are here. You see, if this parable says anything, it says that God is generous and gracious to every one of us. That all of us and each one of us matter to God. We are all important to God. It doesn't matter if a church has 50 in it or 5,000. They all matter to God. It doesn't matter if you've been a Christian all of your life or a Christian for 15 minutes. You matter to God. It doesn't matter if you can give a dime or a million dollars. You matter to God. God's economy of things is not the same as the world's economy. The world says, he who has the most toys wins. God says, he who is last shall be first. And the greatest of you is servant of all. So again, you see, we have a choice as persons and as a church to simply celebrate the gifts that all of us have and celebrate the opportunity and privilege we have to work in God's kingdom, to be a worker in His vineyard. Because each and every one is equally, equally important to God. Several years ago, Jennifer Jones won an Academy Award for her portrayal of young Bernadette, a Catholic nun, in the movie, The Song of Bernadette. For you see, in this movie, Bernadette has received a revelation. She has received a vision of the Immaculate Conception. And because of that, she has become quite a celebrity. People are coming to see her, asking her of things. An older nun in the convent 
is angry and jealous and prays to God, why her and not me? No one has worked harder than I have. No one has served longer than I have. No one has suffered more than I have. But yet she is the one who is chosen and not me. Angry. Angry. Jealous. Grumbling over generosity. The later scene in the movie shows young Bernadette down on her hands and knees scrubbing the floors. And all of a sudden she collapses. They send for the doctor. The doctor comes, examines young Bernadette, then turns to the older nun and says, um, Has she never complained? And the nun says, No, uh, she just quietly does her work. Why? He said, well, you see, the affliction she has, she has had a long time. And the pain is unbearable. Later on a scene, and the older nun prays to God, thank you, Lord, for the honor of serving the one you have chosen. Why can't we quit engaging in silly comparisons and just rejoice that all of us are gathered together in this vineyard to work as workers to enjoy the generosity and the grace of him who calls us. I love the little story of the little boy. He has saved his pennies. Not much, but saved his pennies. He goes to town to buy flowers for his mother. His mother is dying. She loves flowers, and he, he has saved his pennies to buy her some flowers, and he goes, and he finds there are none. Dejectedly, he is walking back home a different way. When he walks by the most beautiful garden he has ever seen in all of his life. He cannot believe its beauty, its immensity. And, and he asks the caretaker of the garden, uh, Please, can I buy some of these flowers as a gift for my mother? And the caretaker says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. These flowers are not for sale. You see, these flowers belong to the king. And he does not sell them. And with that, the little boy turns dejectedly towards home, wiping away a tear from his eyes, when all of a sudden there's a voice behind him which says, Wait a minute, young man. He is right. These flowers are not for sale. They belong to the king. And he does not sell them. But he does give them away. And with that, the son of the king loads up the arms of the little boy with flowers for his mother. Do you know who that was? Do you know who that was? Do you know who that was that the son of the king who gave the flowers to the little boy? You know. You know. Why you are respecting yourself in some way. Uh, now, go forth in peace to love and serve the Lord.